Good afternoon. Welcome, one and all, to the 2017 David F. Peters Lecture. We are very glad that you are here. The David F. Peters Lecture Series was established in 2003 by former trustee Jane W. Peters in memory of her late husband, a former trustee of Westminster Canterbury Management Corporation and Foundation Board, David F. Peters. David was well known in the Richmond community. He was an attorney, attorney and a civic leader who died in March of 2000. He graduated from Washington and Lee University and Duke University Law School. During his successful career with the Hunt and Williams Law Firm, he won their pro bono award in 1999 for his work at the firm's Church Hill office. David was serving on the Westminster Canterbury Foundation Board when he died. Inspired by his service, his wife Jane later also served on the board here at Westminster Canterbury and retired as chair of the Foundation Board after six wonderful and productive years. Her gifts to Westminster Canterbury Richmond include the endowment of this lecture series and also the support of our health services training staff. When Jane made the gift to endow the lecture series, she had this to say about her late husband. Dave was a philosopher at heart and would be pleased to know that his memorial gift was helping to bring special speakers to the Westminster Canterbury family to nurture the spiritual well-being of us all. Through the years, the superb Peter's lectures have been brought to Westminster Canterbury, including such renowned theologians and authors such as Catherine Patterson, J. Philip Newell, Will Willimon, Harvey Cox, Diana Butler Bass, Barbara Brown Taylor, and many others. Mrs. Peters is with us this afternoon with Elizabeth, her daughter, and I would ask that you join me in expressing appreciation to her for her vision, generosity, and wonderful support of Westminster Canterbury. And now on to today's lecture. Westminster Canterbury is thrilled that Reverend Dr. Steve Eason, nationally known pastor, author, and educator, is our 2017 Peters Lecturer. I first met Steve when he was on the Board of Trustees at Union Presbyterian Seminary here in Richmond. I was excited to meet him because I had used his book, Making Disciples, Making Leaders, for elder training in my presbytery, and I was impressed by his easy and clear and theologically sound way of presenting biblical principles for leadership and how churches would benefit from training leaders in such a manner. The next time I met Steve, I continued to be impressed. I was attending a national conference of the young shakers and movers in the Presbyterian denomination. The name of the conference is called The Next Church, the idea being that the young folks who were there were being groomed to be the leaders in the next church. Steve was the primary plenary speaker for this next church group of young people. And despite the fact that I believe he was the only speaker over the age of 30, and perhaps to some a representative of the former church, or my dad's church, he brought down the house with his humor, honesty, and ability to quickly turn a phrase and touch a heart. It was clear that whatever is next for the church, Steve has some thoughts to share about that, and that is why he's here with us today. And no doubt Steve has impressed many of you as well, for many of our residents here are members of First Presbyterian Church, where Steve recently completed an interim pastorate. He was pastor of the Myers Park Presbyterian Church for 13 years in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the largest churches in the denomination, and is going now to Sequoia Hills Presbyterian Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Steve is a graduate of East Carolina University. He earned his master's 
from Duke Divinity School and his Doctor of Ministry from Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta. On a road that has taken him to speak in many different places on this globe, we are fortunate that for today, he is here with us, sharing with us his thoughts on the future of the mainline church. After Steve's presentation, he will take a few questions from the floor as time allows. So let's hear about the future of the mainline church. Will you welcome with me Reverend Dr. Steve Eason? I need to pay her for that. Wait a minute. Where is she? I was curious what you were going to say, and you said everything I wrote. Good afternoon. Good to see all of you again. Good to be back in Richmond. We moved, and then um, we had the opportunity because of uh, Jane and this wonderful lecture series to come back. So I want to thank Jane and Elizabeth, your family, for doing this and uh, giving me the honor of being here. Um, and uh, to Lynn, who dealt with all the details of getting me here and um, taking care of me while I am here. So very grateful to be back. It's quite an honor. Secondly, I, I want to, uh, to ask the question, what was I thinking when I chose this topic? This is one huge topic. Um, what is the future of the mainline Protestant church in America? All those words are very important. The mainline Protestant church in America. What is that? Well, some claim the term is derived from the Philadelphia mainline. True enough which was a train that connected a group of affluent suburbs in Philadelphia. On that line were these seven denominations, these seven churches. If I call out your denomination, would you raise your hand? Okay, when I call it out. The first one on the main line was the United Methodist. Do we have any United Methodist? Okay. Evangelical Lutheran. Yep. God bless you, ma'am. <laughs> Episcopalian. Yeah, how did I know that? American Baptist. Okay, very good. United Church of Christ. Do we have one? Where? Okay. Um, where am I? Disciples of Christ. Okay, thank you, sir. Maybe some others. And, of course, Presbyterian, if you're Presbyterian. Hey, look at that. <laughs> All right, now the problem with that many Presbyterians being in a room is I I've got to take up an offering. So if y'all will wait just a minute. <laughs> I mean, I can't let that go. You get that many Presbyterians, I've got to get some money out of those people. But here's what we're not talking about. Okay, we're not talking about the Catholic Church even though, you know, we share Christianity with the Catholics, of course. We're talking about the mainline Protestant American church, just in America. Okay. We're not talking about evangelical Protestant church. That's a different, they're not considered mainline. Nor are we considering any non-denominational churches like the Hope Church here in Richmond or the Calvary Church in Charlotte, those aren't considered mainline. Nor are we really considering the African American churches or ethnic churches like Korean churches or Chinese churches that are in America, again, not considered on that Philadelphia main line. So there are seven sister denominations in what's considered mainline church. And we're not talking about any churches outside of the United States of America. That's very important because churches that in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly in third world type countries, are actually growing while churches in America are shrinking. 
So we're talking about American mainline Protestant church. Why are we interested in it? Because it constituted what once was considered to be American Christendom. The mainline Protestantism was considered the unofficial, official religion of the United States of America. I learned this in getting ready for this talk today. There are currently no Supreme Court justices serving who are members of a mainline church. Isn't that amazing? There are Catholics, there are Jewish people, there may be people who don't attend any church, but there are no Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Meth, all those seven I just read serving on the Supreme Court. That was unheard of in your childhood, youth, and young adult lives. The Supreme Court would have been, the government would have been, most leadership positions would have been people who were members of the mainline Protestant American church. That's how much it has changed. I also did not realize this. At one time, the mainline church, being the largest religious tradition in our country, it is now declining at a faster rate than any other major Christian group in America. So not only is it not growing, the mainline church, it's shrinking as we speak. In his book, uh, The End of White Christian America, Robert Jones writes this, after a long life spanning nearly 240 years, he's talking about the mainline church, after a long lifespan, nearly 240 years, white Christian America, a prominent cultural force in this nation's history, has died. Yeah, that's, that causes you to pause. Powerful statement. Though the mainline church is not dead yet, and I can testify to that having just served First Presbyterian Church here in Richmond, there are some Sundays they look a little dead, but most of the time, <laughs> most of the time they were awake. But though the, the mainline churches are not literally dead, they are not growing, they are shrinking, they are going, they are in decline. Now as a consultant, I served uh, for a year uh, with a consulting firm out of Atlanta and our job was to equip clergy of all denominations to be better at what they do. That means better preachers, better administrators, be uh, better fundraisers, better teachers, all the things that pastors have to uh, do was our job, is to make clergy better. And everywhere I went, I would always ask the question in my opening seminar, what has changed around and within the church since you were a child? Okay. Now churches in Montana, these are places where I went, some of the places I went, churches in Montana, Michigan, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, and Virginia, they all basically said the same thing. Here's what they said. Since I was a child, the mainline church has changed in this way. It's now losing members. Many of your adult children and your grandchildren are not attending church. And we don't talk about that to each other because it's a little embarrassing that our children aren't going to church. I'm a minister. My adult children are not all going to church. So um, it's, a, you know, it's something we don't talk about. If your kid lives in Washington, D.C., you're like, well, I don't have to tell anybody she doesn't go to church, so I won't mention it if they don't ask. <laughs> have your grandchildren been baptized? No. Mm -hmm. That's the shift that we're talking about. So I'm not so much worried about you. I feel like you're going to get into heaven one way or the other. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, maybe a couple of you not, but most of you. <laughs> but it's your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren that what I'm talking about this afternoon will most impact. Here's what they say. Churches are losing members. 
The population in the mainline church is aging. The median age in the, in the um, mainline church in America is 57 years old. That's up. There is very little denominational loyalty anymore. So people will church hop and they don't care if it's Episcopalian or Lutheran or Baptist or Hope Church. Uh, they want to go to where something happens for them, with them, to them, about them. The preaching needs to be good, the music needs to be good, but they could not tell you what was the difference between a Methodist and a Presbyterian or an Episcopalian and a Lutheran. Those old battles are over and they're in our history and we don't even know what some of those differences today are. We do know when you go to the Episcopal Church there's a lot of books. You have to do the books. And you do want to be around an Episcopalian at cocktail time. Uh, but other than that, those are simple ways we talk about our denominational differences, but the deep levels that split us and divided us in the days gone by are gone. And your children, who are baby boomers, and your grandchildren, who are X, Y's uh, generation type people, your great-grandchildren who may be Z generation, those, those folks could care less about denominations. So there's no loyalty to the Presbyterian church, per se. Here's what else they say. Budgets are shrinking, attendance is down, there's a growing distrust in institutional religion. Stores used to be closed in honor of the Christian Sabbath and now they are open with blue laws on Sunday, the malls are open. The Belks were members of my church in uh, Myers Park and uh, Tim Belk, who was CEO at the time, and they've sold the company now, but at the time, Tim said, our number one shopping day has now become Sunday. Sunday. There's no more prayer in public schools. There are dual career working families that's not an evil thing, but when mom and dad both have careers, the time that families have to give has shrunk. And they come to Sunday morning, and it's like Sunday morning is our only time. And they don't want the structure. They don't want to have to get the kids dressed. There is in, these are still answers that the people in these uh, consulting groups gave me. Increasing biblical illiteracy. People don't know the Bible. So when I'm preaching about Jesus and the disciples and I'm telling a particular story and I may use the word Pharisee in that story, people have no idea what a Pharisee is. There's a growing lack of knowledge of the Bible. Now we have opinions about things. We have opinions about homosexuality. We have opinions about divorce and remarriage, we have opinions about women being in ministry, we have all kinds of opinions, but we have less and less biblical knowledge to support those opinions. So we argue, but we don't have the biblical authority to back our argument. Then they added this, youth sports on Sunday. You see your grandchildren doing this, youth sports on Sunday. I'm 63 years old. On Sunday, when I was a kid, you went to church. Everybody went to church, or you thought everybody went to church. You had to either have a fever or be throwing up to not go to church. <laughs> Those two things. I could make myself throw up, but I could not fake a fever, you know? <laughs> so most of the time I had to go. And after church, what did we do? I don't know what you said, but here's it. We went home and went in the dining room and had dinner, Sunday dinner, that my mother had been working on for two days. And you didn't go anywhere on Sunday but to church and that dinner, and when that dinner was over, you didn't do anything rowdy. You couldn't play tag football. Uh, we couldn't go to the movies. I didn't think that was rowdy, but you couldn't go to the movies. I guess because somebody was having to work in order for you to go to the movies. So the Sabbath, the Christian mainline church in America, American Christendom, 
was driving this country's schedule and driving its train, and now it's not. It's not even close to driving that train. Youth sports, increased church and clergy scandals. Our youth, our children are looking at the church and seeing affairs and fraud and brokenness in the humans who claim to be the leaders in our church. And with seven days a week, 24 hours a day media service, we now know way too much about everything than what we used to know when the news came on at 6 and 11. And then at midnight, that round thing came on and your TV started beeping. And, and that meant go to bed. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. So the legalization of same-sex marriage, that split the church up in some ways. The church has been split over the years over a lot of stuff. Slavery, women, uh, and now same-sex marriage legalized in our nation. And many churches have gone uh, that way and other churches have not. And people have left our denomination and formed new denominations. Technology has changed since you were a child. Nobody looks at a bulletin board anymore. They want electronic stimulation, emails, uh, newsletters. We will mail a newsletter to older people who don't use email. I don't want you to raise your hand if you get a paper newsletter. I know, I see it. But there are, very, there are less and less people we mail paper to in the church. We've changed the way we communicate. There's an increasing, they say this, there's an increasing secular culture in our nation. And then they say this lastly, there's a shorter attention span. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. So those of us trying to preach and talk for 20 minutes are talking to people who are used to having a clicker or a mouse, and they can get rid of whoever's talking to them as quickly as all, the delete button just does it. And there are people in churches that are pushing the pew trying to get a delete button to get me to be quiet, and, I, and we get to talk 20 minutes. Nobody in our culture gets to talk 20 minutes anymore. Everything is in sound bites. You have to get it short and quick. So things have changed in America. And they've changed forever. We won't be going back. And the mainline church has not kept up with those changes. As has, uh, by the way, healthcare, business, education, there's also a lag in all of those institutions with the changes that have occurred in our culture. Now, in the 1990s, the U.S. Army War College introduced a new acronym to describe our current cultural environment. Now, think about that. The draft was over. They're trying to get people to join the armed forces. They're looking at the American culture. They did a, a sociological study of it, and they came up with an acronym, acronym called VUCA. VUCA. Here's what it stands for. V stands for volatility. That's in our current environment, volatility. U stands for uncertainty. People aren't sure which way to move or what to do. C stands for complexity. Things are much more complex. And A stands for ambiguity. That's what the War College came up with as, an, as a description of American culture today. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That means things have changed so quickly that we are not sure how things work anymore. And so there are no experts at the top somewhere who know what should be done and lower it down to the masses at the bottom to say, here's what we're going to do. And that's true in all fields, including the church. And so we live now in a VUCA world. And some of the old ways of doing things are no longer effective. But the new things change so fast that we struggle to adapt 
because the changes are so fast. You see the situation, you just don't know what the solution is. And so it becomes a matter of trial and error. This is going on with everybody. This is going on in education, it's going on in healthcare, it's going on in business, it's going on in the church. The old tracks aren't carrying the trains because we're not using trains anymore. And so we're trying to figure out how our organizations work and things are changing so quickly around us that we're having to try things and experiment. Peter Drucker uh, was known as the founder of modern management and he identified five elements of an effective plan. And they may be helpful for the mainline church as we move or face the challenges of the future. Here's the five elements of an effective plan. Abandonment, concentration, innovation, risk taking, and analysis. Now what does all that mean? Organizations that want to thrive in this current VUCA environment need to abandon things that are no longer working. Someone once said, when a horse dies, it's an excellent time to dismount. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? Yeah. When a horse dies, it's an excellent time to dismount. And yet, what does the mainline American Protestant church do? We keep our dead horses. We put memorial plaques on them. We spray, um, you know, um, whatever that is, air freshener around them. We change riders and say, put a new rider on it. You ride it for three years, and maybe it'll make it different. We whip a dead horse harder. We change the name of it. So maybe the new name of it will be a new thing. When the truth is, there are many things the mainline church is doing today that got us to where we are, but aren't going to get us to where we need to go. Those things need to be abandoned, says Drucker. There are some things, though, where you cannot afford to lose or change. And by concentration, Drucker means to concentrate more on the things that you do well. Find the things you do well and get better at those things. Concentration. Innovation is obvious. What are the opportunities, the new conditions that are emerging issues that are facing us? And what do we need to create that is not currently here? What needs to be new? And this takes experimentation because none of us quite know. Any organization that wants to grow, whether it's a bank or a church, needs to take risk. And so where is the church taking risk? Churches aren't known to be risk takers. Avoiding risk, however, could be the kiss of death for the mainline church. Because maintaining a museum will not cause or it's not sustainable for the mainline church. Finally, there's analysis, and here's what he means by that. What do we not know? We're not sure whether we should abandon this thing or whether we should concentrate on it. We're not sure what to innovate, and we're not sure where to take the risk. We need more intelligence. And you can't just change things for the sake of changing them. So who is doing this kind of Drucker work in the church today? The future of any organization in this current VUCA environment is dependent upon leadership. So let's talk about leadership in the church. Seminaries and divinity schools, you know the difference between the two? A seminary is a freestanding school in and of itself. A divinity school is attached to a university. That's why it's called a divinity school. So Duke Divinity School is attached to Duke University. Princeton Seminary is a seminary. It is not attached to Princeton University. It's called Princeton Seminary because it's in the town of? So now you know the difference between a seminary and a divinity school. Those schools are training clergy. And over the next 20 years, we're likely going to see a reduction in the number of these schools. The Presbyterian Church has 11 seminaries or uh, divinity schools. I think all of ours are seminaries. 
We have 11 seminaries. And there's been a projection that in the end we will end up with three. Endowments are floating seminaries, not enrollment and tuition. So as endowments are spent down, the ones who have the fatter endowments will last longer. Princeton Seminary will last a long time. Some of our, our other seminaries won't. Not as many people are entering the ministry as they were 20, 25, 30 years ago. Fewer churches can afford a seminary trained pastor. They can't afford to pay the minimum salary and the benefit package, which is your pension and your health care. 86% of all Presbyterian USA churches are 200 members or less. 86% of the Presbyterian church is 200 members or less. That's an amazing number. And many of those churches can't afford a full-time pastor. So here's what's happening. People who want to go in the ministry have to have another job. So why go to seminary for three years and acquire debt and come out to a field and a market that cannot afford to pay you a fair day's wage? And you're going to have to have a second job to boot. So these pastors with other jobs are known as tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. Make your money somewhere else, serve the church in a part-time capacity. There may be a day when a full-time paid clergy is a thing of the past, especially in the mainline Protestant American church. The seminaries and divinity schools that do survive will have to adapt. The way they train clergy is going to need to change. And yet, get this uh, math. If you're a pastor, you have to have Old and New Testament classes. You need church history, ethics, preaching, worship classes. You need polity classes, which are government. You need pastoral care classes, and you need theolo theology courses. Many of our seminaries have already dropped Greek and Hebrew. There are usually three years of seminary or divinity school, six semesters, four courses per semester. That's a total of 24 courses going through seminary, 24. You heard the disciplines I just laid out. All of those have to be taught in 24 courses by tenured professors. So who is teaching clergy how to lead the church in this sea of change. Where do they learn leadership? Who's teaching them how to deal with declining numbers, declining money, a secular culture, an aging population? Seminaries aren't addressing these issues for the most part. Transforming theological education will have to be a part of the future of the mainline Protestant American church. So things have changed. We live in a VUCA world. Leadership development is key to moving into this future and facing these challenges. But here's another variable I want you to grasp. There used to be considered three generations in our culture. That was the adults, uh, the grandparents, the parents, and the children. And not much was done to study generational studies. But since then, we now have six generations. Six generations in one church. So when I'm preaching on Sunday morning, I'm preaching, if all of them are there, to six different distinctive groups of people and how they think is different. Here they are. The first one is the GI or the builders generation. They were born between 1901 and 1926. The youngest in that generation would be 91 years old today. That's the oldest generation we have in the church. The oldest would be a hundred and something. Okay. That generation, think about what they grew up with and, and the way they think about life and the way they think about the church and the way they were raised as children and they're still living and they're still in our churches. 
The second generation is the silent generation, born between 1927 and 1945. These folks would be 72 to 90 years old today. The silent or the mature generation. They are the children of the builders. The builders, why are they called that? Because they built the schools and the colleges and the hospitals and the organizations in our country um, and their children are called the matures so they were influenced by these people who saluted the flag and did their duty and served their country these people who knew something about depression and the value of money impacted the silent generation they're in our churches the third one is the baby boomer generation which i belong to born between 1946 and 1964 it was a huge population of people they would be 53 to 71 years old today and then there's Generation X, which are the children of the baby boomers, born between 65 and 1980. They're 37 to 52 years old today. And Generation Y are the millennials, born 1981 to 2000. They are now 17 to, 20 to 36 years old. And then Generation Z, they were born 2001, uh, is that right, 2001 to 2017? Yes, that's correct. So they'd be zero to 16 years old today. Why is all that important? Because each one of those generations has been shaped by changes in this country. And as the modern church is looking at those six generations, it has not adjusted to how those six different groups distinctively think. A good argument in a, in a church, and some churches have arguments, <laughs> is when, and they don't know they're doing this, they're arguing over an issue, and they're coming at it from three different generational viewpoints. Generation the Builders is going to see the issue this way. Generation Silence is going to see it another, and Baby Boomers see it yet another way, and the Millennials are going to see it totally different. Each generation relates to the church differently. The older generations tend to make more significant financial contributions to the church, your generation. And yet when your income becomes limited, your giving to the church may decrease. Your children are not picking up the same level of generosity to the church and other organizations that you had. What's happening to the main line? Protestant church in America, funding is shrinking. When funding shrinks, staff shrinks. That's where the money is, personnel. When staff shrinks, program shrinks. When program sh shrinks, outreach shrinks. So the funding issue, the money issue, is a real issue going forward for the mainline Protestant church in America. Why? Because of generational differences. The younger generations are more prone to support um, target giving than they are to give to an institution. In other words, we need money to buy coats for the homeless. Millennials will give you money. But we need you to sign a pledge card to support the church so it can pay its light bills, its pastors, its program, all the things that it takes, insurance, everything it takes to run a church. The younger generations are not interested in institutional support. We're going to see a financial crisis in the mainline church in the next 15 to 20 years when you and I are no longer here and the people behind us are not picking up the tabs that you picked up. Building staff programs outreach will all be comp competing for a shrinking pool of dollars. Other things are generational driven like styles of worship. You and I like a particular style of worship, but churches, main, the mainline church, have tried new styles of worship. So you can dress informally and have a rock band lead the music and not an organ, and you can have a good cup of coffee and uh, you don't meet in the sanctuary, perhaps, but you have what they call contemporary worship. But these stylistic changes that we've made, and we've been making these changes for the last 15 years, 
have not moved the attendance needle very much at all. Rachel Evans um, wrote an article for the Washington Post back in 2015, and it received a lot of attention uh, in the church world, and she wrote this. A church can have a sleek logo and a website, but if, it's, if that church is judgmental and exclusive, if it fails to show the love of Jesus to all people, millennials will sniff that out. Our reasons for leaving the church have less to do with style and image and more to do with substantive questions about life, faith, and community. We, the millennials, are not as shallow as you think. And I don't think millennials are shallow. I actually think millennials are making a turn to go back and pick up values that we have moved away from. The younger generation doesn't buy into the slick. They want more substance. That could be hope for the mainline church moving forward. Richard Rohr identifies two halves of life in his book, Falling Upward. And in the first half of life, he says, we're working to build our containers. That means we're getting our education, our families, our houses. Those are our container issues and where we can buy our own car and, and do our own stuff. But then he said the second part of life, or the second half of life, is more about the content of life that, is, that goes into that container. So that if you spend your whole life at the container level, constantly thinking about your container and trying to build your container even more and get more and more container, but you've not dealt with the content issues of that container, you end, end up with a very shallow, and banal kind of life. And yet every sense of content has to have a container. Nothing wrong with houses and education and cars and the things that support us. But Rohr's push in this book, Falling Upward, is to say in the second half of life, what is the content that goes into who you are? What is your content story? Who are you? And what are you about? In this VUCA environment, volatile and uncertain and, and ambiguous and changing rapidly with six distinctive generations and their differences, the mainline church is going to need to focus on more content and less container. That's got to be a part of the mainline future. Why are we in business? What are we really doing here? What is the purpose of a church in Richmond, Virginia, or anywhere else? What is our business and what is not our business? Abandoning things that no longer work for us, concentrating on things that do, innovating where we need to innovate, taking risk instead of maintaining a museum, and analyzing the things we don't know. It's going to be imperative for us to move to content. Now, if we gathered everybody who is currently in the mainline Protestant church in, in America in one room and asked them what they thought the future might be, it'd be a very interesting discussion. Some people would deny that all that I've been talking about is even going on. Our church is fine. What, what are you talking about? I like it the way it is. Other people would argue that the church may continue, but it's going to change. It's going to look different in the next 15 to 20 years. And still others are watching the membership dwindle. They're watching their children not attend church and their grandchildren not a part of it. Your <clears throat> grandchildren who don't know the hymns, don't know what baptism or communion means, don't read the Bible, don't know the Bible stories. We are becoming pre-Christian, not post-Christian, pre-Christian in that culture is moving all the way back around before Christianity existed to where nobody knew what Paul was talking about when he showed up that first day trying to build a church. What, are you, what is this? It's Christianity. Explain it to us. That's where American culture is currently moving. Stanley Hauerwas, a retired professor from Duke Divinity School, 
and co-author of a book written a little bit ago, Resident Aliens, Life in the Christian Colony. He doesn't see the future of the church as being gloom and doom, and neither do I, by the way. It's more like the American church is being pruned that the dead wood is being cut off of it so the new life can come back. Have you ever thought about this? All the churches the Apostle Paul formed in his three missionary journeys, which are currently in Turkey, Turkey area, all the churches he formed are now closed. None of them stayed open. It changed. The church started on those three missionary journeys, but it evolved into something else. And that's God at work through the church, not maintaining the old structure and saying these first missionary churches must stay open now for eternity. No, those churches launched the church that Constantine blessed in the 300s. That church became something else, and then we came, became the mainline Protestant church in America, and there may very well be a day, I don't think you'll live to see it, not that I'm thinking you're going to check out anytime soon, but <laughs> in 15 to 20 years, there could very easily not be a mainline Protestant church. And would that be bad? If the church evolves into something else, you and I weren't called to sacrifice our lives for the Episcopal denomination. We weren't called to sacrifice for the Presbyterian Church USA. We were called to follow Christ and to be faithful unto him. Harold Wass says, we American Christians are at last free to be faithful in a way that makes being Christian today an exciting adventure. I like that. We're a people of resurrection, we Christian people, and we believe, therefore, that God brings life out of dead places. And yet, I want you to think about this. <clears throat> when Jesus rose from the dead, he apparently did not look like the old Jesus. Mary didn't recognize him. She thought he was a gardener. He must have physically looked totally different. The disciples on the road to Emmaus walking with him for, for some time couldn't physically recognize him. That may be what's going to go on in the mainline Protestant church in America in that God will bring life to dead places, but it might not look like what it used to. It's resurrection. It's something different. It evolved, and we can be a part of that <clears throat> in our attitude toward the changes that happen in the church. The bottom line is this, we can't go backwards. We can't go back to the days you were kids. That church is gone. The question now is, what church will God bring? What will it look like? Who will be in it? Those of us in the mainline church believe that the church will never close its doors. It just may look different. In that spirit, we will always have hope for the future for the church. Amen. <clears throat> I've got uh, 10 minutes for questions. Okay, you don't have any? Thank you so much. <laughs> we have microphones, um, so if you have a question, raise your hand, they'll bring you a mic. This lady on the left side right there, yep. Uh, I speak for the silent generation. Um, I think uh, God honors all faiths and what we're born into, we tend to stay with. But I see a good thing coming out of uh, the, uh, this time now, you mentioned the word, what it was, uh, I think we're all coming together more than we have. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I know that, I don't know what your statistics are on atheism or ethics now in our country, but I don't think we're, the younger people of this generation are not believing in God. I think that 
they, like we say, we are changing, and how far it will evolve, I don't know. But uh, I, I think your presentation was it's excellent. I think everything, I agree with everything you said, but uh, it does disturb me as a silent generation uh, member that uh, we are turning more to ourselves and not, uh, even though we are recognizing God as God, but, but we are really going forth with uh, who we are and what we can do, and I don't think God gets enough uh, reverence or recognition from us. That's just my personal opinion, but thank you. Paul. Yeah, no, you're very welcome. Just I don't want to take your question time, but I'd respond to that by saying you know, there's so much more I could have said about this. One of the things you brought up is there is a movement in this country where people feel like I can be spiritual without being religious. That's a little mantra that's going around. I can be spiritual but not religious. Meaning I can have a relationship with God. I don't need a church or a synagogue to do it. Um, and, why, and so the question for us, those of us in the church or in the synagogues, is why do you need a church? If we can't answer that question, they're not going to answer it for us. That's why I say content, drilling back down into what the church was meant to be, is going to be our task for the future. Otherwise, our grandchildren aren't going to be a part of this thing. Um, I envied, I've told First Presbyterian Church this, but I envied the guy who was my cleaners in uh, Charlotte because I'd take him my shirts and uh, they were dirty and then I'd come back and pick them up and pay him and they'd be starched and clean hanging on a rack and I said, Kenny, I really envy you. He said, why? I said, because you're so clear about what your business is. You know, I bring you dirty shirts, I come back, I pay you and he said, yes, that's very important and then I give you your shirts back and I said, I go to a church here in Charlotte, and we're not as clear about what our business is as you are. And he's the cleaners. We need to be as clear about what we do as what Kenny is, or else we're going to continue to see a landslide of membership and financial support for the church. Other questions? I don't want to preach. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll take this. I want to make sure I give equal opportunity here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, the church is growing in certain parts of the world, like the global south, yeah. Korea, Africa, right, uh, and also some of the non-denominational churches are yes. growing. Are there any lessons that we can learn from their church culture or their vision that could um, energize the, the mainline churches? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you for asking it. Um, because I've found the mainline church, when it, sees, when it sees how it's struggling, this happens for Presbyterians anyway, they see how they're struggling and then they look out at the Hope Church, which is a non-denominational church, and think, how can, what are they doing and then we need to do that? Well, no, you don't. Um, that's not your DNA. You couldn't be them if you wanted to. Uh, it wouldn't be authentic for you to try to be a Hope Church. Nothing wrong with a Hope Church. But they're clear about what they're trying to do and how, the style in which they're doing it. You take a mainline church and try to turn it into a Hope, and you know, you're going to have a job on your hands. Knowing who you are, get good at what you do, is the concentration part of, of Drucker that we've got to do. Yes, there are lessons we can learn. The Southern Hemisphere, though, when you're in a third world country, the church is going to grow because poor people have no inhibitions. They, they need God. They need food. They need health care. They need God to take care of them. And they will go to church so that God will bless them and take care of them. And I'm not, I'm not diminishing their religiosity, but I've been in those countries. I've been in Congo and Malawi and, and others where the churches are full, but they're not. I mean, even there, um, the church struggles. But the numbers are up in some places. What we're seeing with uh, evangelical Protestantism, which is sort of the conservative right uh, church, Jerry Faldwell's moral majority at one point, um, um, Pat Robertson's 700 Club at one point, both of those kind of faded away, fading away. Um, but what we're seeing there is now a start of, of they've uh, reached their peak and they're starting to take a dive with the rest of us. They're just diving at a slower speed than the mainline church is. Christianity church in general is going through a scrub down. 
in this country. People don't want to be in church on Sunday. They don't want to hear a preacher for 20 minutes. They don't understand the rituals. They don't know the Bible. So all of us, including Southern Baptists, by the way, Southern Baptists are, have, have started to see decline in their attendance and in their Sunday schools. When the Baptists start going down, we're all going down. <laughs> I mean, because they are some faithful people. I mean, all kidding aside, they are very faithful people. And, and if their numbers start tanking, you, you know, you, we better pay attention. Yeah. Is there anybody over here? I want to be oh. fair. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a congregation or two that you see is moving in the direction you're talking about? Yeah, yes and no. In the mainline church, you're talking about the seven denominations I just mentioned. Um, yes and no. What I see that seems to be working in mainline churches are when they've done this Peter Drucker model. And they don't know it's the Peter Drucker model, but they, they've stopped doing things that don't work. They're concentrating on things that do. But they seem to be moving away from membership churches where I join and pay my dues and I get services in return. Like if I'm in the hospital, you come see me and I get a nice church service, beautiful music. That's a membership church, like a country club in a sense. Um, and they've moved away from membership churches to discipleship churches. And there's the shift from container to content. Discipleship is an old word that simply means student. If you're a disciple of somebody, you're a student of that person. So we're moving for people, or churches are trying to cultivate a, a culture of discipleship or where I am a student of Christ. So I'm learning from Christ himself through the presence of the Holy Spirit. I know if you're not Christian and you're here, that's a lot of churchy language that needs to be unpacked. But talking in shorthand, that's where I find churches doing some growing is that they have shifted to the content away from the container. It's not so much about numbers anymore, how many members do you have, as how faithful are you in what you're doing. Um, the old American Christendom model is, how many members do you have? Well, we had 4,800 members in Charlotte. And with the children and the non-confirmed people, we had 6,600. So what? You can have 6,600 people in a room all doing nothing. <laughs> you know, you just have a lot of people who are in the wrong place. So the issue becomes, what are you doing with the people you've got? And what are you doing? What is your money story? What is your money doing in those churches? Uh, because you want your money to have a story. You want your money to work. You don't want it to just, you don't want to just give it away. So, yeah, I do see some of that shift. I do. I, in the Presbyterian church, I do. And in the Episcopal church, the Methodist church, I see that. Um, yep. Let me take another one. I've got a minute. I'll take one more. The best question of the, of the night right here. Yep. It's very interesting and disheartening to hear your statistic. Yeah. However, I'd like for you to say to me, this is what I see us doing. I don't see the solution. Yeah. So I'd like to hear some of those from you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to be here till six. Um, no, and my wife, Catherine, uh, couldn't come, but she said, do not go and be so negative that everybody walks out of there and thinks we're all going, you know, to pot. And she said, leave them with some hope. And I said, well, if you go to your doctor, you do want your doctor to do the diagnosis. Tell me what I got. Tell me how bad it is. Tell me what the pathology is. Tell me what I'm dealing with and then move to a treatment plan. Exactly what you're asking for. Don't leave me there with diagnosis. I do not want to leave you with diagnosis. That's one reason I gave you the Drucker model because I think in that process of moving away from some dead horses, concentrating on the content of what a true church should be, a place of faith and prayer, a place of discipleship, 
not a place that's calculating where we have, you know, 4,800 members and a $6 million budget. I mean, those things don't matter anymore. Nobody cares, okay? So moving the church to content would be my answer to your question, and leadership needs to do that. Both the clergy leadership that need to be trained in our seminaries to know how to do that, and our lay leadership, the people on our vestries, the people on our sessions, our boards, because it's not just a clergy thing. There's a lot of pressure on clergy today because the church is suffering membership and money loss and congregants will turn to the clergy and go, there must be something wrong with our preacher. <laughs> you know? If we had the right preacher, we would pull everybody into church and they'd be given money, but apparently he or she's not good enough. Now, th I'm serious about this. And as I've consulted with these, I mean, I've been around the country talking to clergy, so I've seen it. And, and so clergy are, are, are sort of feeling this depression like, I can't overcome by myself the cultural shifts that have happened in this nation. The plates have moved in the earth. And a clergy person cannot fix that shift. And so when you're looking at your preacher, let me just beg you to, I mean, they might not be any good. I mean, there are a lot of clergy that <laughs> they aren't any good. Um, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> you can always find something good about everybody. But you know, they might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. But even if they were, you know, you got to be careful of people who want to be prima donnas and superstars. And so you get somebody who thinks they can overcome everything I just shared with you, that I'll overcome that with my personality and my style. Be very careful of that wolf, okay? Um, these are complex issues I'm sharing with you. And they're systemic. And they're outside the church. It's not an internal problem, it's an external challenge. So clergy are facing this pressure as well as uh, all the rest of us. But I don't know that I swung the bat the way you wanted me to, but. But I, I'm, I'm about this content thing. I'm about churches moving to content. And um, I think when we do that, the millennials are going to see us as a much more attractive organization um, than, than maybe what we are today. You've been kind. Um, I've been honored by this. You've had some very big dogs in this lecture series. When Lynn called me, I said, I know two things. You've either run out of big dogs or you've run out of money because <laughs> You're down to me, right? And she said, no, I got plenty of money. Thank you, Jane. Uh, but she said, and I said, so you ran out of big dogs. And uh, Lynn, you're kind uh, to invite me and uh, to have me as a part of this. Uh, it, it really has been an honor for me. Thank you so much. Thank you.